Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadikap, hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon and English study group where we study the words of the Buddha. We're in volume nine, which is titled The Six Sense Bases. And today we're going to be exploring chapters 11 through chapters 20. And these chapters are actually really short in nature. Some of them are just like a half a page long or a page long. And what you have is you have the words of the Buddha, which are the words that he spoke during his lifetime and have been translated from Pali into English. There's a reference to allow you to go back to the original source text where there's the longer discourse. And then there's explanations and guidance that I'm providing in terms of helping you to reflect and understand the teachings and help you to bring that into your practice in your daily life. And by you learning, reflecting, and practicing independently verifying the teachings, then your mind can move closer and closer to this enlightened mental state where it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. The way that we start out this class is with a brief meditation just to prepare the mind. Then I'll basically turn the class over to all of you and specifically the moderators so that we can read each chapter and then I will share some teachings on that chapter and then open up to any questions that you have. If you have joined us in the past, then you've most likely read these chapters before class, and you might have questions that you're coming to class to seek clarification and understanding on these chapters. But if you are just joining us for the first time, then it's okay because we're going to be reading the chapters during the class and discussing them as part of the class. But then in the future, if you'd like to join, you can download these books by going to buddhadailywisdom.com and there you'll see a button for free books and you can download them and actually read the chapters prior to class and then you'll get so much more benefit by coming to class having already read the chapters because you'll already kind of be thinking about them. And we usually cover about 10 chapters a week and that takes about an hour, hour and a half to read, but I would suggest doing it in small increments rather than one big dose is kind of read like one or two chapters a day, which will take you maybe 15 minutes 20 minutes and then you spread that out over your week and it gives you more time to sit with the teachings and really think about them and reflect on them and have some thoughts about them and even start moving them into your daily life and actually practicing them and then where you're having challenges understanding the clarity and what the buddha actually taught that's what these classes are for you can ask questions here you can post questions in the facebook group you can send me a private message or you can schedule personal guidance and receive help that way too so i'd like to welcome all of you to our class if you'd like to start out with meditation and join us for that you're welcome to do that just go ahead and get the lower body ready and the hands and arms ready as well relaxed and comfortable not luxurious but also not uh, completely you know complacent and completely you know zoned out either not real uptight and not luxurious the upper body though should be nice and erect that keeps the mind attentive and alert during the meditation because meditation is an active dedicated purposeful training session and you would like to actively train the mind during this meditation. I'll start with some chanting and you're welcome to join along with that. And then afterwards, I'll just give some very brief guidance since this is a class that people typically are meditating regularly, don't need as much guidance. And then I'll be quiet for a while and then finish out with a chant. Poor tongue, Marco, 
नीवाति सवखो मघवता तमो दाम नमसा सुपथिपनो मघवत सवको संघ नमी नपमोर सगवत हार तो सुत नपमोर सगवत हार तो सुत नपमोर सगवत हार तो सुत सीसो मगवा हार मोत चरण समुनो सखातो रोकावी तो अनु तेरो पुरी सा सती सता तवा मनु स्न तो भगवत ओके यू शुड जस्ट बी ब्रीदिंग इन थ्रू द नोज एंड आउट थ्रू द नोज यूजिंग दिस फर्स्ट पार्ट ऑफ द मेडिटेशन जस्ट टू एस्टैब्लिश द ब्रेथ अ नाइस नेचुरल ब्रेथ breathing in through the nose wherever you get to your next inhale and then a nice gradual exhale through the nose breathing in and out once the breath is established as a nice gradual natural breath start fixating the mind on the sound of the breath or the sensation of the air moving into the nose this is the present moment fixate the mind on the breath the present moment breathing in in out Whenever you notice that the mind is off the breath cut that off let it go and come back to the breath the present moment Breathing in in out
a little top-up meditation just to kind of prepare the mind for class. Most of you guys are probably doing two or three meditations a day or at least building up to that and working towards it. So welcome to all of you guys that have joined us since we've started class, whether you're in Zoom or Facebook, YouTube, or if you're listening to this on the replay, on the podcast, or anywhere else. Welcome to all of you. What we're going to do is we're going to go through the 10 chapters of today, which are chapters 11 through chapters 20 in the book, The Six Sense Spaces, which is volume nine of this book series, The Words of the Buddha. So I'll turn things over to all of you guys so that you can read each chapter. And then as you're reading, then afterwards I'll do some teaching and kind of share some thoughts on that particular chapter and then open up to any questions that you guys might have. So I'll turn things over to all of you. I'll begin with chapter 11. With destruction of excitement, the mind is liberated. Seeing rightly, he experiences the fading away of strong feelings. With the destruction of excitement comes destruction of craving. With the destruction of craving comes destruction of excitement. With the destruction of excitement and craving, the mind is said to be well liberated. All right. Thank you, Manal. So here, the Buddha is talking about liberating the mind, which is the actual goal of the path to enlightenment. And we call it liberation because the mind becomes free of these strong feelings. It's no longer bound up. It's no longer experiencing these conditioned feelings of conditioned pleasant feelings, conditioned painful feelings, and conditioned feelings that are neither painful nor pleasant. So those conditioned pleasant feelings are like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, Conditioned painful feelings are things like anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear. 
And then neither painful nor pleasant. I usually put into this category things like boredom or loneliness, although some people say that's quite painful for them. But shyness is something that's neither painful nor pleasant or discomfort or unsatisfactoriness. And the Buddha is explaining here that the way to get to this liberation, among all of his other teachings that he's explaining it as well, but this particular part, he's sharing seeing rightly, meaning understanding the wisdom, understanding the wisdom of these teachings, being able to see clearly, no longer having this delusion or this ignorance or unknowing of true reality. The mind can investigate the teachings, reflect on those and practice and see the truth for yourself. So if you see rightly, if you have this wisdom that he's guiding you toward, he experiences the fading away of strong feelings. So if you see rightly, of what is causing these strong feelings, of these conditioned feelings, and you have the wisdom of what's causing that, then you also are experiencing the diminishing or the fading away because you understand the path and how to work towards the elimination and diminishing of these strong feelings to ultimately get to this liberation of mind where the mind's enlightened and experiencing peace, calm, serenity, and contentedness with joy permanently, no longer experiencing these strong feelings or this discontentedness. And the way to understand that as part of this path is that with the destruction of excitement comes the destruction of craving. What the Buddha is explaining here is that when you see the arising of these conditioned pleasant feelings, which excitement is one of those, then what you do is you cut that off and let it go. And if you're practicing the four foundations of mindfulness, then you'll see this excitement coming as just a bodily sensation. And you can observe it there and cut it off and let it go. But if you miss it as a bodily sensation, then it's going to become a feeling in the mind and you can still cut it off and let it go there. If you don't let it go there, it's going to be affect the condition of the mind now for the next few minutes or hours or days or what have you. And then from there, we form these mental objects. In this case, it would be something like maybe central desire. And then this is the four foundations of mindfulness. And you need to be aware of these four foundations because the sooner and sooner you can catch these conditioned feelings as a bodily sensation and cut it off and let it go there, this is how you destroy craving because it's craving desire attachment this mental longing with a strong eagerness, chasing after the objects of our affection that arises these conditioned feelings. And if we understand that these conditioned pleasant feelings like excitement is part of the problem, then we can cut that off and let it go there. And then our mind won't swing to the other side when the mind becomes experiencing these painful feelings. So oftentimes we think about happiness, excitement, elation. We think of this as a desirable feeling and we chase after this. This is what we think life is all about in the unenlightened state is these conditioned pleasant feelings and the mind just keeps chasing, chasing, chasing the objects of our desire. And if we get the objects of our desire, the objects of our affection, then we experience these conditioned pleasant feelings. But that's only temporary and it eventually fades away. So that's the major problem that the Buddha discovered is this craving, desire, attachment, this wants, this expectations, this longing, this yearning for these pleasant feelings. Yes, you're going to experience those conditioned feelings, but they're only temporary. So it's only a matter of time before the mind swings over to these conditioned painful feelings of anger, sadness, and frustration. So in order to get rid of the painful feelings, we have to eliminate the conditioned pleasant feelings. But an enlightened mind is still going to have enjoyment. They're still going to have joy. They're still going to enjoy. They're still going to laugh and have fun. But their mind's not going to have a condition of, I want this. That's the only time I'm going to experience this happiness, this excitement, this elation, if I get the objects of my desire, then I'm going to experience these pleasant feelings. But if I don't get what I want, then I'm going to experience these painful feelings. This is kind of like a three-year-old throwing a temper tantrum. Your mind is like throwing a temper tantrum. It's like, okay, if I get what I want, then I'll experience these pleasant feelings. But if I don't get what I want, I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be frustrated. And you're going to have to put up with this miserable discontentedness. So what you do as part of this training is you cut off and let go of this arising pleasant feelings as part of 
the conditioned pleasant feelings. And now that gradually starts diminishing the craving desire attachment that's causing it because that's the condition that's causing these conditioned feelings. And in order to get to enlightenment, you have to be willing to let go of these temporary conditioned feelings in order to get to this permanent joy where the mind is just always joyful. It's no longer basing its inner feelings on some condition, some impermanent condition that is causing the mind to experience these pleasant feelings. So the Buddha is explaining to you here that you know, you've got to get ahead of this curve and address these pleasant feelings, cut those off and let them go because that's what destroys the craving. And then by destroying craving, which we use breathing mindfulness meditation to train the mind to come back to the breath and back to the breath. We also use generosity, this generalized training to train the mind to let go. By destroying craving with those things, then we also see that there's the destruction of these conditioned pleasant feelings like excitement. And this is where the Buddha says, okay, with the destruction of excitement in craving, the mind is said to be well liberated. And as a practitioner more and more trains to eliminate craving, desire, attachment, wants, expectations, this grasping, this holding, this clinging, then you won't experience these conditioned feelings and you'll gradually see those diminish. And then eventually when they're completely gone, the mind is no more longing through these six sense bases for pleasure, then you won't experience this pain either. And now the mind is in the middle. It's just always peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. If it's sunny outside, it's peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. If it's raining outside, the mind's still peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. We're in the unenlightened state. If it's maybe sunny outside, maybe somebody is excited, they're elated, they're thrilled. But then when it's raining outside, they're sad, they're angry, they're frustrated, right? This is what the unenlightened mind does. It goes up and down. But an enlightened mind has eliminated that condition of craving, desire, attachment. So now the enlightened mind understands that the weather is impermanent and I'm not going to base my inner feelings on this impermanent condition of something like the weather, for example. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? Looks like Miranda has her hand raised. Thank you, Manal. Um, on Facebook, Amina asks, is the best way to destroy the excitement by focusing on the breath and in those moments, try to calm the happy thoughts? You can do that. That could be a potential way, especially as you're getting started and you're observing the bodily sensations. If you can observe the bodily sensations starting to come with these pleasant feelings and you can just cut it off and let it go like really easily, this is somebody who's really near to enlightenment. And the Buddha talks about this. But you know, before we get to that point where the mind's very easily able to observe the bodily sensations and easily cut it off and let it go, you might need to do something like what you're sharing, Amina, which is you observe it, you may close the mind, you might start focusing on the breath, realizing these conditioned pleasant feelings are arising, and rather than allowing them to come into the mind, is cut them off and let them go. And the Buddha explains that. He says, any evil, unwholesome mental states can be eliminated on the spot with breathing mindfulness meditation. So if you've got your anchor points where, you know, two or three times a day for 30 minutes or longer, you're doing breathing mindfulness meditation, you're really training the mind well, then in those kind of crucial moments where you need to do a little 30 second closing the eyes, focus on the breath and just let it go, that can be really helpful and it'll be a lot easier when you've got those anchor points. But eventually you'll be able to get to the point where you're just out and about doing things and you'll observe something, you'll feel the bodily sensation and you'll just be able to get rid of it right away. And that's what you would like to work towards. And this person is near to enlightenment because if you can cut off the discontentedness as a rising bodily sensation, then you're getting more and more aware of the mind and this arising discontentedness. Your mind is also getting really well liberated in terms of it's easily able to let things go. And the mind has more discipline at that point. But what you're sharing, Mina, can be a great way to kind of bridge that gap and help you get to that point. Thank you, sir. Also, I would like to check the understanding of this that's kind of forming in the mind. It seems like 
the destruction of excitement is like a multi-layer thing um, where one has to be constantly mindful, aware of the state of their mind, and guarding the sense doors at all times so that they can cut off those early bodily sensations of excitement in order to have this destruction of excitement destruction of excitement and craving come about. Is that correct, sir? Yeah, so the guard that you have in your mind is this mindfulness or this awareness of mind that you cultivate in breathing mindfulness meditation is that as the mind moves through those jhanas, those preliminary phases, before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment, the mind now has this unification or this oneness of mind where there's no longer a subconscious mind. It's just one mind. And you have full awareness of that more and more as you are moving through the jhanas and you're moving into the first stage of enlightenment, you start having complete awareness of the mind at all times during the day. And this is what the Buddha describes as the guard or guarding the sense doors or guarding the doorways to discontentedness. And initially as you're building up this awareness, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of effort because you're not used to it. But eventually you get so well trained in meditation and outside of meditation that you cultivate so much awareness of mind that you're just always aware of it. It's just effortless and you just live your life like that all the time. But it can be quite a challenge to get to that point where you're just always aware. And then as those bodily sensations arise, you start becoming more and more aware of those and you cut them off and cut them off and cut them off. And then as you get rid of the craving desire attachment, eventually you get to the point where there's no arising of any bodily sensations at all because that's the first indication that discontentedness is arising and it's being caused by craving desire attachment so the more you get rid of craving desire attachment the less and less arising of discontentedness that is going to occur so initially it might be you know one thing after another after another after another but then as you sort out your life and you sort out the mind and you are practicing better and better all the time there'll be these longer and longer gaps between any arising discontentedness and eventually you get to the point where there's no arising at all when the mind's enlightened there's no bodily sensations you're just always aware of the mind the mind's just always in the middle all the time and you're not actually having to cut off anything because you've already done all that hard work it's in the past and now the mind is just permanently peaceful calm serene and content with joy thank you sir for clearing that up for me you're welcome there Any... are no more questions okay go to jan for jan after 12. thank you Minal. craving desire is the root of discontentedness Whatever discontentedness arose in the past, all that arose rooted in craving desire, with craving desire as its source, for craving desire is the root of discontentedness. Whatever discontentedness will arise in the future, all that will arise rooted in craving desire, with craving desire as its source, for craving desire is the root of discontentedness. Whatever discontentedness arises, all that is rooted in desire has desire as its source for craving desire is the root of discontentedness all right thank you jan so this is the buddha being utterly clear right i mean he's clear in all of his teachings and you know going back to the four noble truths where he explains the problem of discontentedness the cause the elimination and the path forward and many other parts in his teachings where he talks about craving desire attachment this mental longing with a strong eagerness the mind pulling towards the direction of the objects of its affection is the cause of discontentedness. Well, here he's being utterly clear that any discontentedness that you experienced or anyone else in the past experienced, it's always craving desire attachment. Any craving desire attachment that you or any other being in the future is going to experience, it's all because of craving desire attachment. And then anything that's being experienced right now in the present moment in terms of discontentedness, it's all rooted in craving and desire. All discontentedness arises from craving and desire. So there's just no you know, misunderstanding or lack of clarity here. He's just making it utterly clear 
that it's craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing with a strong eagerness that is causing your discontentedness. And this is helping you to focus like a laser on what is it that you really need to be sorting out? What is it that you really need to be working to eliminate? Because if you're moving towards enlightenment where you're interested in eliminate discontentedness, there's multiple things you need to look at. There's multiple things you need to address and craving desire is a really significant one. So that's what he's doing here is just making it utterly clear that all discontentedness arises from craving and desire, not just your discontentedness, but discontentedness of other people too. So you might be in situations where other people are blaming you for their anger or they're blaming you for their frustration or their boredom or their guilt or shame. They might say, you know, you're making me feel so guilty. But you've got to understand very clearly that just like you cause your own discontentedness because of craving, desire, attachment, other people are causing their discontentedness because of that too. And it doesn't mean you should be in a situation where you're trying to teach that other person, but you don't have to feel that you've done something bad or wrong necessarily. If someone else is saying, you're making me feel so guilty, you can just know that they're causing that guilt themselves because of their craving, desire, attachment. Because oftentimes when we lack the clarity and the wisdom of the Buddhist teachings as we go through life and people might blame us for different things, then we might actually feel that that's the truth and we start might feeling miserable or things like this. So it's important that you understand the truth as it relates to you and as it relates to other people as well, that they are causing their discontentedness, just like you're causing your discontentedness. And by each individual focusing on their own practice and their own development, that's what's going to get us to liberation individually. But each person has to choose to do that for themselves. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Thank you, Jan has a question. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you, teacher David. So I, I like to ask you a question about when other people are feeling discontent and our reactions to them. Um, we've talked about this before, but I still find that I, I feel like I need some guidance. For example, our hot water heater is defunct. Um, there's very little hot water. So the other day, um, my housemate wanted to take a hot shower and I was doing some dishes. So he asked me to stop doing the dishes to preserve the little bit of hot water that we had. And I was like, that's fine. Okay. I'll, yeah, of course I'll stop doing the dishes. Um, and he reached in and he turned the hot water off before I could even do it. He's agitated. And um, so, you know, I understand that that's his, he's agitated, right? And mm -hmm. it's not because I'm using the hot water or whatever, right? It's just that he's, he's agitated. And I was able to stay very calm and just say, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, let, let's make sure we save water for you. But I still feel like I don't trust my reactions. I think maybe this is too long of a question, but I don't always trust um, my reactions in how to respond to people. You know, if it's somebody I don't know, I can I feel very comfortable walking away from them. Mm -hmm. Right. I can't talk to you right now. I'm sorry. You know, but when it's somebody that you live with or that you work with or whatever, right, you can't always just walk away from them. And so any any guidance you could provide, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, this is a big thing we're going to be discussing in our retreat this summer in Washington, D.C., is we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about harmony and relationships and practicing around non-practitioners. You know, this person probably isn't on the path. He doesn't realize that he's causing his own discontentedness because he's craving hot water. And that's where his actions and his speech becomes unskillful and reaches over and, you know, turns off the water when it was very easy for you to do it. So when you see people like this, you should just have loving kindness and compassion for them. This genuine interest in seeing them be well, having concern for their misfortune, realizing that, okay, they don't understand that they're causing their own discontentedness. And as long as you're not overtly doing anything in terms of your speech and your actions, you're not causing any harm there. So based on what you've said, you know, I don't know what transpired, but based on what you said, it doesn't sound like you did anything in terms of like swatting his hand away or, you know, yelling at him or, you know, how dare you do that or anything like that. So 
you're not interested in reacting like that because that would be unskillful. Instead, you're interested in uh, responding and just be like, oh, okay, well, you'd like to have the water turned off? Sure, I can do that for you because in that situation, you're not attached to doing the dishes right now in this specific moment. You realize you could do the dishes now, you could do them an hour or two from now, and you can be content either way. And this is what helps an enlightened being function around unenlightened beings, beings that are off the path, because beings that are off the path, they're going to have these cravings and want something right now, a certain thing right now. An enlightened being is someone who's practicing to attain enlightenment. They can be comfortable either way. They know that all of this is impermanent and I can do dishes now or I can do it three hours from now and be just as content. So since you realize with loving kindness and compassion that this person has this craving for the hot water, okay, let them have it. No big deal. And then just step away and allow the situation to dissolve and move on. So as long as you're not, you know, doing anything overtly unskillful, then there's no harm that you're causing, even though this person is causing their own discontentedness and they might be practicing wrong view, thinking that you're the one causing them to be angry. As long as you know the truth that you're not causing it, then you can move on and just have loving kindness and compassion for this person. Thank you, teacher. You're welcome. We have a hand raised for Marcy. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, teacher David. So with the same thing as what, what Jan was saying, um, I have uh, this particular woman at work and um, she's a very vocally aggressive person in her language, her speech, things of that nature. And, and I noticed that I was having these bodily sensations that it, I, it was causing me discontentedness. I was allowing discontentedness to arise. So I've kind of been able to like, uh, kind of stop it at that sensation. But what I'm coming into conflict now with is that it's almost as though she's seeking me out to have these uh, outbursts and these things. And she's not like aggressing them towards me. They're not towards me. It's just about you know, anything like uh, other customers, things of that nature. And I'm having a hard time figuring out wh what, what can I do? I mean, I've walked away, I've not given response, but it's almost like she, like I'll, you know, she'll come into the lunchroom and she'll start off and I'll leave. And then it's like, she follows me right afterwards and she'll follow me down the aisle trying to continue this, um, this, I call them rants. And I don't know how to kind of just separate myself besides just stand there and not say anything. And I don't, like I said, like, I'm not sure if that's a good reaction. I don't know, like I'm having a hard time understanding like what I should do in those situations. Sure. So you're never interested in reacting because if you react, the mind's going to react typically in an unskillful way. So you're interested in responding. So a response can be walking away or saying nothing or things like that. That can be a response. Remember that craving is very difficult for people to let go of, even people that are on this path. So people who are off the path, it's very difficult for them to understand craving and let it go. So the reason why this is happening is because of her craving, desire, attachment. She has this longing and this yearning to talk to somebody and kind of air her grievances. And she doesn't realize that she's causing her own discontentedness. And she's thinking that, you know, you're this outlet for her. But her mind is going to be very slow to adjust and adapt and you know, you're not trying to train her, of course, but as long as you're protecting your own mind and not allowing it to become discontent, slowly but surely, if you continue doing what you're doing, this will dissipate because it's impermanent. She's going to slowly learn that every time she comes to you, you don't feed it. You don't sit there and listen and just let her vent at you. Then eventually, because she doesn't have that outlet, she's going to realize that you're not somebody that's going to just sit there and absorb that. But it's going to take her a long time for that because of her craving, desire, attachment. If you need to say something to her, like when she's coming in and she's, you know, she's starting to ramp up, you can, let's just say her name's Barbara. I use this name all the time. Once we start having a Barbara in the class, I'll have to use a different name. But, um, you know, you can be like, uh, Barbara, 
I need to go somewhere. I, I'll see you another time. You know, you can like step away like that if you're able to in a very polite way, or you can just step away without saying anything. And even if she follows you, it's okay. Just keep walking. You keep walking around the store and uh, slowly but surely she will get the message that you're not going to be an outlet for her complaining and her her craving. But it's going to take her a long time because she's not on the path and she doesn't understand. But it is impermanent. And this is actually good practice for you, because if you're observing that discontentedness is arising in this situation, it means that there's things that you still need to work on yourself. So each time she comes and talks to you, your discontentedness should get less and less and less and less. You should notice less and less of it. And, you know, definitely continue with your breathing mindfulness meditation. Definitely continue with your loving kindness meditation, putting her in that loving kindness meditation. And slowly but surely, your mind will become more and more content in that situation. And she'll get the message more and more that, you know, you're not going to be an outlet for this complaining and this ranting. Thank you, Teacher David. You're welcome. There are no other questions for this chapter. All right, we'll go to chapter 13. We'll go to Donnie. What one intends, one has a tendency towards monks. What one intends and what one desires, and whatever one has an obsession towards, this becomes a basis for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is a basis, there is a support for the establishing of consciousness. When consciousness is established and has come to growth, there is the production of future renewed existence. When there is the production of future renewed existence, future birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the cause of this whole mess of discontentments. All right. Thank you, Donnie. So here the Buddha's explaining what causes rebirth and he's talking about it in more detail in some subsequent chapters but here he's starting to talk about it here that it's this craving desire attachment he's using different words here like obsession right this is the mind can be obsessed and we might even use the example that marcy just gave where this person is obsessed with just telling you know and complaining and ranting about certain things and that obsession takes a long time for it to dissipate and diminish but if somebody dies with craving desire attachment in the mind there's going to be rebirth because there's this support for establishing consciousness the buddha talks in a chapter that we're going to look at today where he talks about craving is the fuel that leads to rebirth that if there's craving that's the actual cause which actually creates rebirth and this is one of the other reasons why eliminating craving desire attachment is so important on this path because craving desire attachment is what's causing discontentedness but it's also what's causing rebirth as well so you're actually solving two problems with one is you're solving the discontentedness by eliminating craving desire attachment but by having eliminated discontentedness and experiencing enlightenment you've also eliminated rebirth as well where there's no longer future existence because there isn't this support for establishing consciousness and the buddha shares a little bit of dependent origination here which is part of volume 5 chapter 14 where I go into a lot of detail explaining what dependent origination is using the words of the Buddha and then me explaining it afterwards so the Buddha as part of dependent origination this is the highest most ultimate truth where he goes through 12 individual steps explaining how it starts with ignorance and it goes through all these different causes and conditions which ultimately leads to discontentedness and which ultimately leads to rebirth because those are those are the two big problems that a practitioner on the path to enlightenment is solving is eliminating discontentedness so that we eliminate rebirth and as you do that you'll be able to see the truth for yourself that that's occurring so what questions do you guys have on this chapter doesn't appear there are any questions right now all right so we'll go to chapter 14. Uh, go over to jen thank you manal do not favor existence not even for the lasting of a finger snap monks just as even a small amount of dung has a foul smell 
So likewise, I do not favor existence, even for an insignificant amount of time, not even for the lasting of a finger snap. All right. Thank you, Jan. So this is just a short little chapter extracted from the Pali Canon, where you can see that the Buddha is explaining that this existence in the cycle of rebirth, he doesn't favor it because as long as there's existence in the cycle of rebirth, there's going to be discontentedness. There's going to be sickness, aging, death, and there's going to be discontentedness, this despair, this misery, this grief, this displeasure. So oftentimes, depending on where you're learning and what tradition you're learning, people might tell you that the goal of the Buddhist teachings is to be reborn and come back and actually help people to attain enlightenment. But he didn't actually teach that. If you look at his own words, which these are the words of the Buddha, you can see for himself that he doesn't favor existence, that existence means that there's going to be that sickness, aging, and death. There's going to be misery, grief, sorrow, displeasure, and despair, and eliminating all the conditions that are keeping the mind in the unenlightened state, you're also eliminating this continuous existence in the cycle of rebirth. But it's important to note that while he doesn't favor existence in the cycle of rebirth and being in the cycle of rebirth, one is going to experience you know, sickness, aging, death, misery, despair, displeasure, and all those things. Once the mind experiences enlightenment, then the mind is no longer experiencing those things. The mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently. It's no longer experiencing this sorrow, grief, pain, and displeasure. And there's no longer rebirth in the cycle of rebirth. But in terms of once a being attains enlightenment and dies, the Buddha leaves this as an undeclared teaching. He never declared what happens after somebody attains enlightenment and dies. Is there an afterlife or is there not an afterlife? He left this as an undeclared teaching. So sometimes not only do some people say that the Buddha taught the goal is to exist and continue to exist, some people say that once you attain enlightenment and you die, that there is no existence after that, that the candle has been completely extinguished. There's no longer anything after that. But the Buddha actually didn't say that. He left it as an undeclared teaching. So no longer existing in the cycle of rebirth is very different than no existence whatsoever. So the Buddha didn't declare whether we do exist after we attain enlightenment and die or whether we don't exist after we attain enlightenment and die. He just left it as an undeclared teaching. But we do know that if we don't attain enlightenment, then there will be continuous existence in the cycle of rebirth, which would be undesirable. It's not something that we would aspire to experience. We have been experiencing that for many lives so far, but now that we have this human birth, you're coming in contact with these teachings. This is an opportunity for you to deeply learn, reflect, and practice to get to enlightenment so that you no longer are stuck in this continuous cycle of rebirth. And once you get to enlightenment, the mind is so peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy you're not going to care what's next, if anything at all. We don't know because the Buddha didn't share it. So the mind is just experiencing this you know, amazing mental state that the Buddha describes beyond pleasure and pain, whereas if there is something that's next and the Buddha would have explained that, then maybe that's just one more thing for your mind to crave. So the Buddha being very wise, he just didn't declare what is next or what isn't next. He didn't declare whether there is or isn't something next. So you've got to get to the point if you've been taught or you believe that you're going to die and there's this eternal life waiting for you afterwards, you have to get to the point on this path where you don't even care what's next. If there is anything next, just get to the point where you let that go and you no longer crave existence. And by not knowing if there is anything that's next, this is a good way that a wise Buddha would teach and just leave it as an undeclared teaching because it's more easy for your mind to let it go. Whereas if there was something that was amazing that happens after death for an enlightened being, that's just one more thing for the mind to crave. You're interested to get to the point where you're no longer interested in existence in the cycle of rebirth because that would be misery and despair all over again, continuous on and on and on. But you're also not craving of any kind of afterlife either, that you get to the point where your mind's so peaceful, 
that you could die in this moment and be completely content with that. It wouldn't matter. And that doesn't mean you walk out in front of a truck and try to kill yourself because that would be craving for extermination. But you practice this middle way where you still care for the body, you still care for the mind, you still enjoy all the experiences that you have around you, but you're just not craving and clinging to it, wanting it to be permanent, that you understand that all these things you're experiencing are impermanent and death could come at any point and you would just be completely peaceful and content with that. That's a being that's getting to enlightenment or is enlightenment or is enlightened, that they no longer have any fear about death. They're completely comfortable with it. They're no longer holding on and craving for existence. They're completely comfortable with letting go of everything and understanding that all of these things are impermanent. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? There are no questions for this chapter. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Chapter 15. Craving is the fuel for rebirth. I declare, Bacha, rebirth for one with fuel, not for one without fuel. Just as a fire burns with fuel, but not without fuel. So, Bacha, I declare rebirth for one with fuel, not one without fuel. Master Gotama, when the flame is flung by the wind and goes some distance, what does Master Gotama declare to be its fuel on that occasion? When Vacha, a flame is flung by the wind and glows some distance, I declare that it's fueled by the wind. For on that occasion, the wind is its fuel. And Master Gotama, when a being has laid down his body but has not yet been reborn in another body, what does Master Gotama declare to be its fuel on that occasion? When Vacha, a being, has laid down this body but has not yet been reborn in another body, I declare that it's been filled by craving. For on that occasion, craving is his fuel. All right. Thank you, Dani. So here, the Buddha is making it very clear that it's craving, desire, attachment is the fuel that causes rebirth. And this is actually a really good uh, analogy here that the Buddha is describing to help you understand rebirth. Not only the cause, but to understand it itself, because the cause is this craving, desire, attachment, this mental yearning, this longing. If the mind's holding on to anything at the time of death, it's going to experience a new existence. So if you think about this in terms of the fire, like the Buddha is talking about, if there's a fire burning and there's all this fuel that's creating all these flames and all these sparks and everything like this, if this fire has a spark that comes off the fire and the wind carries it and now that spark lands on some leaves it's going to create a new fire because the wind carried it to this other location and now that spark is going to create a new fire it's a completely new fire it's a different fire it's not the same fire as the originating one that the spark came from but there's this new fire that emerges Well, the same thing is that in this particular life, if there's craving, desire, attachment at the end of this life, that craving is like the spark that comes out of the mind. And now that craving goes into the new mind. The craving and residual memories goes into this new mind. And now there's a completely new existence, just like the new fire. That second fire is a brand new fire. It's not the same fire as before. It's a completely new fire, and it was the wind that was the fuel that created that. Well, here in our human existence and all of our other past existences, it's craving, desire, attachment that is the fuel that causes that next emergence of a new life or a new existence in one of these five realms of hell, animal realm, afflicted spirits, human realm, or the heavenly realm. And by you extinguishing craving, desire, attachment, which this six sense spaces, these central desires, that's the craving that that's why this is showing up in this particular book is that it's craving, desire, attachment through these six sense spaces, the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, bodily contact in the mind. This is where the mind's craving through these six sense spaces, and that's going to cause discontentedness, and it's also going to cause rebirth. So you're extinguishing this fire. 
So if there's this fire that's burning and raging and all these logs are getting tossed in and there's all these sparks coming off, but this fire starts to not have fuel anymore. There's no more logs that are placed on the fire. And this fire slowly, slowly, slowly goes out and it starts smoldering. And eventually the fire is extinguished. Now there's no longer a spark to spark a new fire. And likewise, when you extinguish craving, there's no longer a spark. There's no longer fuel to create a new, re- a new existence, a new birth. And that's what the Buddha is helping you to see here in this particular teaching. So what questions do you guys have on this one? It doesn't appear that there are any questions for this chapter. All right. So we'll move on to chapter 16. Go over, Jan. Thank you, Manal. With gratification, craving increases. Suppose, monks, a great bonfire was burning, consuming 10, 20, 30, or 40 loads of wood, and a man would cast dry grass, dry cow dung, and dry wood into it from time to time. Thus, sustained by that material, fueled by it, that great bonfire would burn for a very long time. So, too, when one lot lives reflecting on gratification in things, that can be clung to, craving increases. With craving as condition, clinging comes to be. With clinging as condition, existence. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure and despair come to be. Such is the cause of this whole mass of discontentedness. All right, thank you, Jan. So what the Buddha is essentially getting to here is he's talking about feeding the craving. That if you have certain cravings where the mind is longing and yearning for certain things and you're feeding that craving, like here he's talking about a fire feeding it dry grass and dry cow dung and dry wood, that's going to feed the fire and it's going to make the fire stronger. Well, the same thing is if you have certain cravings, desires, attachments, and you find gratification in these things, then you're feeding that craving, desire, attachment. It's going to keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger. You're not actually putting it out. So let's use something silly like chocolate cake. Like I use this one all the time, right? Like if you're eating chocolate cake and you're just like, oh my goodness, this is such great chocolate cake. Oh, I could just eat the whole entire cake. Oh my goodness, this is so amazing, right? The mind is feeding this chocolate cake and you're starting to become aware of that craving. And then the next time you go to that restaurant, you order chocolate cake again. Oh, my goodness, this chocolate cake. Oh, it's so good. I just enjoy it so much. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. You're feeding it and feeding it and feeding it. And maybe the third time you do the same thing. You're just feeding this craving of chocolate cake and it's growing and growing and growing. And now the fourth time you go, they don't have the chocolate cake. Boy, are you going to be frustrated or angry or irritated because that craving has gotten so strong. So what you should do in order to eliminate this, and that's what the Buddha is giving you a little bit of dependent origination here, is that where you observe those cravings, don't feed them. Don't give them that gratification. Don't allow them to continue. Don't feed them the dry grass, dry cow dung, and dry wood because that's going to make the fire stronger. Instead, where you see that there's craving in the mind, where the mind's pulling towards the object of its affection, you would like to do just the opposite and take the mind in the other direction. So in this example of the chocolate cake, if you observe that the mind's just all over this chocolate cake and wanting it so badly, instead the next time, even though the mind's pulling towards the chocolate cake and they have the chocolate cake, order apple pie or don't order anything at all Mm -hmm. or order fruit or something else, right? Don't feed that craving. And you're going to have to do that multiple times to extinguish the craving. And I use chocolate cake because it's an easy one to talk about. But you could, you know, if you have challenges with uh, drugs or alcohol or if you have challenges with pornography or you have challenges where your eye is, you know, looking at handsome individuals or beautiful individuals and it's always pulling towards that. Right. You're not interested in feeding that not only in the moment. But afterwards, sometimes we sit somewhere and we're like, oh, my goodness, she was so beautiful. or He was so handsome. If I could just have gotten to talk to that person, my life would be so much better. And this is craving. This is desire. This is the mind longing 
yearning for the objects of its affection. So you've got to cut that off. Like the chapter 11 that we were talking about is where you observe that craving, desire, attachment arising, you cut that off and let it go. And that's what the Buddha is describing here, that when there's craving, it's going to ultimately lead to clinging, where the mind is holding on, which is ultimately going to lead to existence, and which is going to lead to birth, aging, death, sorrow, grief, displeasure, and and discontentedness. So in that moment where you're observing that the mind is wanting to have this gratification, it's chasing after the objects of its affection, this mind is like a different entity. The person has to be stronger than the mind and it has to discipline this mind and say, no, you're not going to get that today. I'm going to take you in an opposite direction. So there's this body, there's this mind, and there's this person, these three entities. And the body and the mind have come together for this unique existence. And this person that we call Manal or Jan or Marcy or Donny or David, we've labeled this body and this mind combination, and we're calling that the person. This person needs to have more willpower and more strength than the mind because the mind is undisciplined. It wants to run around like this wild animal and just feed its craving, desire, attachments. But where you see that, the Buddha is saying, okay, don't allow that to happen because then craving's going to increase. And you're not interested in the craving increasing. You're interested in it decreasing. And once you eliminate the craving, going back to the example of like a chocolate cake, after you go to this restaurant three, four, five, eight, ten times, and you're not even thinking about the chocolate cake, you don't even care about the chocolate cake, you've let that go, you've moved on from it, you realize that it's no longer a craving, then something like a piece of chocolate cake, you can actually start eating it again and just know that you're not going to allow the mind to crave it and yearn for it and long for it because there's nothing harmful there in that chocolate cake. Something like drugs or alcohol or some of these other real detrimental things, you're not going to ever go back to those because those lead to unwholesome results if you have those going on at all. But there are certain things that the mind craves that after you eliminate your craving, you can actually still use those things or be involved in those things and you can be just fine. So let me give you another example. Let's just say that every Monday you go play basketball with your friends or every Monday you go spend time with your girlfriends and you guys talk and spend time and you notice that on Sunday and Monday morning, your mind's kind of longing and yearning for this time with your girlfriends or with your friends to play basketball or something like this. Well, if you do that regularly and you feel your mind pulling and yearning and longing for it, then you should probably skip a couple of times and train the mind that it's not going to get this permanently, that it's impermanent. Particularly if you're missing your friends, if you observe that your mind, you know, even though you're not there with your friends, you're thinking about that, you're missing them, you're longing for it, you're yearning. You've got to train the mind to eliminate this craving, desire, attachment to always be with these people, craving and clinging to them. And then as you kind of do this, where you spend time with them and then maybe you don't go a couple of times and then you spend time with them and then you don't go to a couple of times and you realize that the cravings completely extinguished over time, then of course you can continue to spend time with your friends. You're not going to just completely walk away from your social relationships, but you're interested in getting to a point where there's not this yearning, this longing, this craving, desire, attachment, because as long as you have this craving, desire, attachment, and you get all these conditioned, excited feelings when you're going to see your friends, then when you can't go see them, you're going to be sad. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be bored. So you would like to get to the point where you've extinguished the craving for that and you've observed in the mind that that craving is no longer there. And then when you decide to now start going again, now it'll actually be even more enjoyable because you can go there and you can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy that you're there But then on those occasions where you can't go because of impermanence, then you can also be peaceful, calm, serene, and content uh, with joy there too. Because if your mind is longing and yearning for that time, when you're not there, your mind's going to be discontent. It's going to have these painful feelings. And when you are there, you're going to feel all this excitement rising up. 
So when you're with your friends, you enjoy it. You have fun. You, you know, spend time talking and socializing and all those things. You can enjoy those kinds of things, but you need to understand in the mind deeply that this isn't permanent. It's almost like while you're having the conversations, while you're on your way even there to go see your friends, you should understand that, okay, I'm going to go there. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going to spend time with them. But this isn't permanent. If my mind clings to this, there's going to be discontentedness. So you need to really get ahead of the curve and observe the mind with mindfulness that whenever you see the mind longing and yearning for something, you don't allow the mind to indulge in that over and over and over again. But instead, you introduce some impermanence, training the mind that it's not going to permanently get what it wants, which is either the chocolate cake or going to see the friends. And then when you train the mind like this, then just kind of going regularly or as you decide to go see your friends or as you decide to have the chocolate cake, your mind can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy either way, whether you have the chocolate cake or go see your friends or whether you don't. You're just completely content either way. But you've got to have that mindfulness and observe that mental longing and yearning and then do just the opposite and train the mind that it can't have the objects of its affection permanently. You're not going to allow it to do that. So what questions do you guys have on this chapter? Mina asked on Zoom, is gratification the same as receiving compliments? Like if someone says, I am doing a good job as a mom, it feels nice in the moment, but now able to let it go are compliments like the wood going into the fire if you allow it to be it doesn't have to be so if somebody compliments you about being a great mom and you revel in that and you allow the pleasant feelings to arise then you're feeding that craving you're taking gratification in that compliment because you can't control people of whether they're going to compliment you or not. People are going to compliment you and they're going to compliment you even more. The more enlightened you become, people are going to compliment you even more. So when you hear these agreeable things, you just understand like, oh, thank you. I appreciate your kindness or whatever you're going to say. But you don't allow that to arise, the conditioned pleasant feelings, because you know that at some point somebody's going to say, you're a horrible mom. You do such a bad job. How dare you uh, do that with your child or whatever, right? People are going to disparage what you do. So if you allow this conditioned pleasant feelings to arise in that situation where someone's complimenting you, then in the situation where someone's disparaging what you're doing as a mom, that's going to cause painful feelings in your own mind. So these things can feed the mind and you can take gratification in them. But what the Buddha is guiding you to do is not to take gratification in them. It's just observe it for what it is, which is someone's being kind and polite and friendly, respectful. They're offering you a compliment. Wonderful. You know, you can thank them for that. You can appreciate their kindness, but don't allow the mind to obsess over that. Don't allow it to feed this craving. Instead, keep that craving gone and Try to eliminate it so that it's just words that somebody's sharing with you and you might thank them for their kindness and their, you know, their friendly words, but you don't allow the mind to arise these conditioned pleasant feelings. And you should get to the point where you can feel these conditioned pleasant feelings as bodily sensations, yes. And then when it moves past the bodily sensations, you can feel it in the mind. You can actually feel this tingling or these this uplifting where the mind's like, oh, wow, that feels so wonderful. That's the feelings coming into the mind. And when you observe this, you know there's some conditioned feelings there and you would like to cut that off and let it go and just observe it for what it is, which is someone's being polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. And then say whatever you like or respond however you like. But don't let the mind take that gratification and feed it and fuel those cravings because once you fuel and feed those cravings there's just more for you to have to eliminate in terms of the central desire and hearing pleasurable things we'll go to miranda next thank you manal um on facebook michael ricasio asks teacher david i noticed that attention has a part in feeling craving Would it be wise to not give attention towards these objects of affection? So you're not interested in feeding it, right? So if somebody's going to give you a compliment or somebody's going to share something with you, then obviously you're going to hear it. 
Uh, you can't, you know, block your ears and close your ears. So that's why you, you can't control others, but you can control your own mind. So in situations where you feel your mind pulling or having these yearning and longing, you've got to restrain the mind and pull the mind back and don't allow it to do that. So you're using the word attention, you know, giving your attention to it. Usually there's a period of time where you observe that the mind has certain craving, desire, attachments. And then when you're aware of that, then you can take direct action to cut those off and let it go and no longer feed it. So I'm not sure if that's quite answering your question, Michael. You're welcome to ask follow-up questions if you like, but you're not interested in feeding that craving, desire, attachment, because that's just going to make it stronger. And now it's going to be even harder to get rid of that you're feeding it. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Teacher David, I just wanted to ask a question related to um, the example of uh, fire being used in the previous chapter and and this chapter. I'm not sure if this is two sides of the same coin or if this is inaccurate, um, but the I, I was taking the fire more as representing the actual craving that the mind has. And, and um, so, excuse me, I take that back. So I was cow dung being fed into a fire. I um, equated that to craving being fed into the mind. So in your um, description here in chapter 16, you say that the fire is actually the craving. You uh, write that if one is interested in eliminating the fire of craving, desire, attachment, which is the cause of all discontentedness, they would extinguish the fire through not allowing the mind to dwell in the past where pleasant feelings arose. So I I just don't know if I'm thinking correctly. Is the fire the actual craving or is um, the cow dung basically craving being fed into the mind being the actual um, translation here? Yeah, the fire is craving. So that's why we describe craving, anger, and ignorance or the unknowing of true reality as the three poisons, the three unwholesome roots, or the three fires. So there's these three fires burning in the unenlightened mind. One is craving, one is anger, one is ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. And what a practitioner is doing to get to enlightenment is extinguishing the fire of craving, extinguishing the fire of anger, extinguishing the fire of ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. And it sometimes helps you to think of them as fires because you can feel the craving burning oftentimes, especially when anger is arising, you can feel like, oh, there's that fire, you know, that craving, anger, and ignorance. But sometimes it helps you to think of it as poisons and you're antidoting the poison with these specific antidotes of that antidote, craving, anger, and ignorance. And then other times it's more helpful to think of them as these unwholesome roots and you're uprooting these unwholesome roots and you're bringing in the wholesome roots. So it really depends what analogy or which picture you would like to to use, but I think all of them are helpful in different situations. Here he's describing the fire, which is the craving, desire, attachment. The cow dung and the grass and the, the wood and all of this, this is like adding things like, like if we think about the complement, the complement, if we allow that to obsess the mind, now that's the cow dung. Or if we know we have a certain craving, this burning desire to look at handsome men and handsome women and beautiful women, and now we go to the mall and we're sitting there, you know, kind of eyeing all these different people coming in and out of our of our eyes, that those individuals that we find handsome or beautiful, that's the grass, that's the cow dung, that's the wood, and it's feeding this burning fire in the mind of craving, and it's making this craving stronger. So if you're going to extinguish this fire, you're not going to feed it dry grass, cow dung, or wood. So if you're trying to extinguish this craving of looking at handsome and beautiful people, you're not going to allow the mind to take that in through the eyes, that where you're walking and you see a beautiful person or a handsome person, you will cut that off and now choose to redirect the mind in a different direction. And that would be not feeding it this dry grass, cow dung, or wood. 
Yes, very clear. I understand that better. Thank you. You're welcome. We'll go to Marcy. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, Teacher David. Um, so, Teacher David, would I be correct in saying that the cow dung, the wood, the things of that would be like allowing things to come in through the six sense based doorways and add fuel to already cravings that are inside? Is that kind of a, an analogy that I could see it as though? Yes. And the thing is, is that there's going to be things that come in through the sense bases. But oftentimes early in practice, you're guarding those sense bases and doing things like what you talked about, where like this person comes into the employee break area, gets ready to rant and vent, and you decide to take these six sense bases and you walk out and kind of try to distance yourself from this contact of the sound of this person's voice and seeing their bodily movements, you're trying to distance yourself from that. And this is part of protecting the doorways to discontentedness. But in the future, once your mind is more protected and you don't have these craving desire attachments, you could just sit there and you can hear all the things she's saying and it wouldn't disturb the mind at all because there's going to be input into these six sense spaces. But early on, there's this agreeable and this disagreeable contact that is arising either these pleasant feelings or these painful feelings. And one of the ways to cut that off and let it go is protecting the doorways by doing things potentially like what you're doing is, is distancing yourself from it. And this is a good way early in practice. But over time, as you do that more and more and the cravings more diminished, you won't have to do that, that you could just sit there and eat your lunch and this person could be ranting and raving and whatever they're going to do. And you could just continue to eat your lunch and it wouldn't disturb the mind whatsoever. You'd be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, regardless of what's going on, because there's no longer this craving for agreeable contact. So therefore, there's no longer this disagreeable contact either. You will just view this person's voice is just sound, you know, just like wind coming out of somebody's mouth. And it's not going to shake up the mind either way. So all of these sensory inputs. So with the eyes, it's form. With the ears, it's sound. With the nose, it's odors. With the tongue, it's flavors. With the body, it's physical objects. And with the mind, it's mental objects. Those external sense bases of form, sound, odors, flavors, physical objects, and mental objects, those are the grass, the cow dung, and the wood that's going to be coming into the mind. And what the Buddha is saying is don't allow that to feed your craving. And there's going to be these things because you can't avoid these things coming in. You can distance yourself early on, which is what you're doing, Marcy, but eventually you're going to get to the point where you won't need to do that. So that as these things are coming into the mind through the sense bases, you don't allow the mind to cling to it. You don't allow the mind to take this gratification to these things that can be clung to because that's where craving increases. So where this person is venting their complaining and their disgruntledness to you, rather than look at that as disagreeable and I don't want this, I don't want to hear this. Instead, if you can start viewing it as just, it's just sound, you know, I'm not going to crave something different. This is just sound. It doesn't matter. Same thing is like when you're eating and there's certain food that we taste, there's some food it's like, oh my goodness, this is just so amazing. And then when we taste something else, it's like, oh, this is horrible. I don't like this. Instead, just view it as a substance to nourish the body and keep it healthy. That this food that we're eating, it's not to please the tongue and please the mind. It's just to sustain the body. So as we're eating, if food tastes good, it's just like, all right, it tastes good. Interesting. You know, just keep eating it. But then when something doesn't taste so well, train the mind to be able to eat that as well. Oftentimes when we taste something and we don't like it, we might get up and throw it away. But if you're interested in training the mind to eliminate central desire, that the mind doesn't cling and crave these pleasant tastes and flavors, that even when you taste something and you're like, oh, that doesn't taste so good. Now, of course, 
if it's bad, if it's got bacteria in it and it's going to make you sick, throw it away. But if it's just a taste that you don't typically taste and you're not typically comfortable, the mind isn't typically comfortable with this flavor, keep eating it. Train the mind to keep eating it. This is actually going to be really helpful that the mind doesn't always get what it wants. Because in that situation, if you taste something sour or something bitter or something that you won't normally eat and the mind's like, oh, I don't like this and it's repulsed by it, that's a perfect opportunity for you to train the mind to eat it. Because in that situation, the mind's having that little temper tantrum because it's not getting these pleasant feelings. It's not getting this agreeable flavor. So since it's having this little temper tantrum, keep feeding it that stuff, that bitter, that sour, whatever it is that the mind's repulsing. Now, when you do that over multiple, multiple situations, now the mind realizes it's not going to always get something that is pleasurable or agreeable in its in food. And now it can be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no matter what you put into the mouth in terms of food. And you do this with each individual sense base that you train the mind that when it's longing for these pleasurable things and experiencing these pleasurable experiences, that where you see the mind's repulsed by something, you actually train the mind to experience that. So here's another example is like, say that you have this craving for animals to always be safe and to never be harmed. And that gives you great pleasure when you see that animals are well taken care of. Well, now when you scroll Facebook or you're on the internet or whatever, and you see animals being harmed, the mind gets sad and it's repulsed by this. What the unrelated mind usually wants to do is it wants to have aversion and push that away and never see pictures of animals being harmed ever. But that's not possible because that's permanence. So rather than push this away and allow the mind to have aversion and now scroll really fast and get to something else that's more pleasurable, where you observe that the mind is seeing these animals being harmed and your mind doesn't like that, instead sit there and look at it longer and look at it some more. And then over the next few weeks, every couple of days or so, go out on the internet and find pictures where animals are being harmed and where they're being harmed. Look at those pictures and train the mind that it's not going to always get what it wants, which is these, you know, cushy, cuddly pets that are fluffy and in good condition that you're going to sit here and you're going to look at these pictures. You're not taking joy in the pictures, but what you're doing is you're just training the mind that these pictures are animals being harmed and this is what happens in the world. And doing that over multiple sessions, you're desensitizing the mind rather than it always craving to see animals in pleasurable, comfortable situations. And then when you happen to run across the picture where they're not that way, now the mind experiences painful feelings. Whereas if you desensitize the mind to it and you actively seek out every two, three, four, five days over multiple sessions, animals that are in harm and you desensitize the mind to that. Now, when you run across the occasional picture of animals in a pleasurable, fluffy situation, it's like, oh, look, those animals are look so cute. They're so lovable. Oh, wow. That's so wonderful. But then when you keep scrolling and you see animals in a harmful situation, you're not shaken up by that. Whereas if we keep having aversion and we keep pushing away those harmful pictures, now every time you see one, the mind's going to be shaken up. So what you do is you confront it. You put the mind in those situations and have it look at those pictures for a while until over multiple sessions it's desensitized and it's no longer shaken up by a picture of animals being harmed, for example. Thank you, teacher. David, um, so just a real quick follow-up question to this. So in order to grow um, on my path in this journey by maybe staying in the lunchroom and... I don't want to say enduring, but being in the presence of this, the discontentedness that this woman is feeling may help strengthen my, my practice in a sense. It would be training my mind to not have aversion and not want to run away, to be able to tolerate it and be able to gain this wisdom of where it doesn't, there's no good or bad to it. It just is sound. Yes. That's ultimately what you would like to get to. But in that situation, if you're feeling like unskillful speech and actions about to occur, 
that's where it's better to just walk away. So that's why I say early in practice, if you're observing that this discontentedness is arising and you're trying to cut it off and you observe that there's going to be some unskillful speech and actions, that's going to cause harm to that person and that harm is going to come back to you. So in that situation, it's better to just politely get up and excuse yourself and say, excuse me, I need to go do something else. I'll see you another time. And you just walk out. And that's protecting the mind and ensuring that you're not having unskillful conduct as a result. But as you let go of that craving more and more and you're able to sit in that lunchroom and just you know be unaffected by this person's complaining that's actually really helpful for your mind and that's where you have to decide as your own independent journey what makes sense for me in this situation depending on what else is going on in your life and what the condition of the mind is maybe sometimes you decide to get up and walk away maybe other times your mind is stronger you feel like you have more discipline and you can sit there for a little bit and see and observe the mind and see what it does in that situation but ultimately you should be able to just sit there and be completely unaffected by it it doesn't mean that you still choose to sit there but you could and be unaffected by it you still might even when you're enlightened and someone comes in and complains you might still choose to excuse yourself and walk out even though your mind is utterly peaceful and content but this is a way for you to help that person to no longer be stuck in this cycle of constantly complaining about the things that are going on around them there's not just one way to do this you would like to just observe the mind see how things are going in some situations you might get up and excuse yourself walk out other situations you might sit there it really depends on what's going on in your own mind and ensuring that you're not having unskillful conduct is is very important but also training your own mind to understand that you can't always walk away that that's not necessarily the solution because you're going to be in situations where you're sitting there and someone's saying something that you disagree with and how do you deal with that and training the mind to be understanding of that and being able to still practice good wholesome decisions in that situation can be very helpful for the mind thank you so much teacher david you're very welcome and miranda has her hand raised thank you Mino. um can sir can the mind also crave crave enlightenment and if so can that craving hinder of being moving forward to the stages of enlightenment? The answer is yes and yes. A being can crave enlightenment, which is that peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. They can have this mental longing, this yearning for it. And as long as they have that craving, they'll never experience enlightenment because enlightenment is to extinguish all craving, desire, attachments, even craving for enlightenment itself. So what you do is you practice working towards enlightenment as a goal, an objective, or an interest, something that you're gradually working towards rather than longing and yearning for it. And then also rather than being complacent as well, those would be the two opposite sides, craving and yearning, longing for it, or complacency. Those are two opposite sides. The middle way is, okay, I'm going to gradually work towards this as a goal, objective, or interest. I'm going to go to class regularly. I'm going to read the book regularly. Of course, I'm going to miss these things occasionally due to impermanence. I'm going to meditate consistently and regularly training the mind. I'm going to actively develop and train the mind more and more. It's almost like you're sneaking up on enlightenment rather than, you know, yearning or longing for it, or rather than just be complacent and be like, yeah, whatever, you know, I'll just meditate once at once a week or once every few days right so you find that middle where there's consistency there's ongoing efforts there's this dedication this determination and this diligence towards working towards this goal or this interest this objective thank you sir you're welcome there are no other questions all right so we'll move to chapter 17. we'll go to kayla Thank you, Mel. Craving is the basis for coming and going, which is the cause of discontentedness. Monks, what one intends and what one desires and whatever one has an obsession towards, this becomes a basis for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is a basis, there is a support for the establishing of consciousness. 
When the consciousness is established and has come to growth, there is an impulse. When there is impulse, there is coming and going. When there is coming and going, there is passing away and being reborn. When there is passing away and being reborn, future birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. Such is the cause of this whole mass of discontentedness. If monks, one does not intend and one does not desire, but one still has an obsession towards something, this becomes a basis for the maintenance of consciousness. When there is a basis, there's the support for the establishing of consciousness. When the consciousness is established and has come to grow, there is impulse. When there is impulse, there is coming and going. When there is coming and going, there is passing away and being reborn. When there is passing away and being reborn, future birth, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. Such is the cause of this whole mass of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Kayla. So here the Buddha is going and teaching the way that he often teaches, which is showing this cause and effect relationship this action and result. This is the natural law of gamma, the natural laws of existence, where he's saying, okay, if this happens, then this is going to happen. And when that happens, this is going to happen. He's showing this causality of things as he's teaching. So here he starts off explaining, you know, with what one intends, desires, and has an obsession towards, this becomes the maintenance of consciousness. So if there's craving, desire, attachment, then that's going to maintain the consciousness and it's going to keep it continuing on and on. When there's a basis, there is support for the establishing of consciousness, that rebirth. When there's consciousness is established and has come to growth, there's impulse. And we've experienced these impulses, right? That's that reaction that we talk about, that the goal isn't to react in situations. The goal is to respond. So when the mind's reacting, there's this impulse and it's usually unwise, it's usually unskillful, and it leads to something that's unwholesome. So you're not interested in this impulsive aspect of what we've experienced at different times. Instead, you're interested in restraining that and now responding in situations. And sometimes you need to pause and think about situations before you actually make any decisions. Because when there's impulse, then there's this coming and going. This coming and going is where the mind isn't content. You know, oftentimes when we're in the unenlightened state, the mind always wants to be going somewhere else. It's not just content with where you're at. The mind always wants to be somewhere else. It's almost like the grass is always greener on the other side. And then once you get to the other side, it's like, ah, this grass isn't as green as I thought it is. I want to go to this other yard. I want to go over here. I want to go over there. This is the coming and going rather than just being peaceful and content where you're at. When there's coming and going, there's passing away and being reborn, right? Because the mind is not content in any one particular place. So there's going to be this constant death and this rebirth, which is what the Buddha is guiding us to eliminate in terms of eliminating discontentedness. Then there's this elimination of the cycle of rebirth. And then he goes on and he explains it the same way, but just without this intention and without this desire. But if one has this obsession, it's the same thing. So there's different degrees of craving. You know, when we talk about craving, desire, now the Buddha is using this word obsession. You know, these are kind of strong words, but there's also kind of these lighter cravings too, where the mind just has this tendency towards something where you're not getting this intense anger. You're not getting this intense rage, but there's just this tendency that if I don't get that thing, then I just feel kind of icky inside. This is discontentedness as well. So as you're diminishing craving, desire, attachment, you might not have these strong cravings that are producing these strong feelings and emotions, but you have these tendencies 
and the mind is kind of uncomfortable or unsatisfied, feeling icky in certain situations. You like to stamp all of that out too, because an enlightened being isn't even going to feel icky in certain situations, not even going to feel unsatisfied in any senses of the word. The mind is just always going to be peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy because there's not even these strong obsessions, but there's not even these lighter kind of tendencies either. And the Buddha is just explaining that as part of this whole teaching here. What questions do you guys have on this? Yes, teacher David, I think you've um, just acknowledged a question that was on the mind about if there is um, a place between when one has intention and desire, but it is not an obsession. So I think you you already kind of elaborated on that, that there can be some um, lighter tendencies that need to be worked on. Um, so related to that, um, would just continuous practice be the answer to um, addressing the lighter uh, sort of desires and intentions, which ha again has not has been recognized as being present, um, has been recognized that there does not need to be growth, that there is in fact a process of elimination that right. needs to occur uh, regularly. Um, would just continual practice be the answer for this? Yes, the same thing that leads to the elimination of those craving, desire, attachments, those obsessions. When there's these lighter tendencies, you've already knocked those craving, desire, attachments down to the point where now there are these kind of lighter tendencies. And the same thing that knocked down those stronger cravings is what's going to eliminate and stamp out these lighter tendencies. So the Eightfold Path, which includes breathing mindfulness meditation, generosity, restraining the mind. It's all the same stuff. You're just applying it for a longer and longer and longer, more and more consistent period of time. So what led to knocking down those craving desire attachments is the same thing that's going to eliminate those lighter tendencies. It's just a matter of doing it more and accumulating the benefits more and more. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh there are no other questions. All right, so we'll move to chapter 18. We'll go to Miranda. Thank you, Mel. The ending, end of coming and going. For him who claims there is wavering, for him who does not claim there is no wavering. Having eliminated wavering, there is calm. Calm being present, there is no bending. Having eliminated bending, there is no coming and going to birth. Having eliminated coming and going, there is no death and rebirth. Having eliminated death and rebirth, there is no here or there, nor anything in between the two. This indeed is the end of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here the Buddha is talking about this wavering mind and the unenlightened mind will oftentimes waver. We will make a decision and then as people say certain things or try to get us to change our decision or ourself, our mind might waver because we're not confident in the decision that we made. So the mind kind of shakes and wavers. So the Buddha is saying here is for someone who doesn't have clinging, there's no wavering. That when you cling and you're having this clinging, you're not quite sure whether what you're choosing to do is beneficial or unbeneficial. So the mind can oftentimes waver, whether it's something we do with our children or life partner, or say we have a breakup and we decide that we're going to end a relationship with a partner. And now because there's clinging, there's this attachment to the partner, the mind might waver and be like, ah, it wasn't that bad of a relationship. Maybe I'll go back or some other wavering that we might do as we go forward in life where there's clinging, the mind will maybe try to distance itself from that thing. But then because the mind's holding on and clinging, it might actually go back to that thing. But when you don't have clinging, then there's no wavering either. You'll just be like, all right, this relationship's done. I'm going to move on. Or I would like to do this, that, or the other thing. When the mind isn't holding on, it knows what it needs to do. And it doesn't experience this wavering that the Buddha's talking about. And when there's no clinging and there's no wavering, then the mind is calm. When there's calmness, the calm being present, there's no bending. When there's bending, what the Buddha is talking about here is like bending in terms of 
the decisions that we make in terms of these teachings. So if we have clinging and uh, craving and our minds wavering and the mind is uncalm, then we might decide to kind of bend a little bit. So let me give an example. Like if I was a smoker and I was trying to get rid of smoking and I was clinging to these cigarettes and now I get to this point where my mind's kind of wavering about the cigarettes. I'm not quite sure if I want to give them up or not. The mind starts to become uncalm. And now because of this uncalmness, because of the clinging to the cigarettes, even though I'm trying to distance myself and there's this uncalmness that comes along. Now there's this bending and be like, ah, I'll just go back and smoke two or three or four. Then, you know, I'll be done with it at that point. So there's this bending. So it's getting rid of the clinging or the craving that eliminates this wavering that brings in this calmness. And then there's not this bending. When there's not bending of these training guidelines, then the mind can come to this more peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy where there's no coming and going into birth to be reborn because the mind now is fully practicing these teachings, understanding them, and it's not bending to kind of the craving, to the clinging. And the Buddha is just explaining that one who isn't reborn, that they're not here, they're not there, nor between the two. And this is the ending of discontentedness. So once again, he's showing this causality of, you know, it's clinging that leads to wavering. And then if there's no clinging, then there's no wavering. With wavering eliminated, then there's calm. And there's this calm in the mind. There's no bending. When bending is eliminated, there's no coming and going. When there's coming and going is eliminated, there's no death and rebirth. When death and rebirth is eliminated. You're not here. You're not there. You're not between the two. There's no existence in the cycle of rebirth. This is the end of discontentedness. So he's just tying all of this back to clinging and how by eliminating this clinging, the mind holding on to things tightly, then it unravels all of these things, ultimately getting to the end of discontentedness and the end of existence in the cycle of rebirth. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Oh, looks like Miranda has her hand raised. Thank you, Manal. Sir, this wavering and bending, as someone is early on in their practice, is this something that is normal that we usually see? Absolutely. And that's why the Buddha teaches it, is so that you're aware of it when it's happening and you realize that this is a normal thing that the mind's going to experience and where you observe it, you can know what the problem is. The real problem is the clinging. So you let go of the clinging, you eliminate the clinging, and then your mind can be more stable in whatever decisions that you're making. This is that steady and stable mind that the Buddha talks about, that when all craving, anger, and ignorance is eliminated, now the mind is stable and steady. There's no longer wavering. But you will see this in your practice all the way up until you're enlightened. You'll experience this wavering And that's why he's explaining it to you here so that you're aware of why it's happening. So then you can implement the solution to fix it. Is this why with the symbol for enlightenment, how it kind of crosses over on itself and goes back a little bit as it's slowly moving forward towards enlightenment? Is that why that's symbolized in that way? Yep. You know, as you're making steps forward, then you're going to make a few steps back and then you make a few steps forward and you make a few back. Or if you're doing it on a linear, you know, kind of line chart, you know, you're working up and then you come back down and then you work up and you come back down and you work up. But there's this forward progress that you're moving towards the light or towards enlightenment, but you're going to have these backward steps. And there's wisdom that you're learning during those times. So I don't even think of them always as backward steps because when the mind's wavering and it's struggling there and you observe the mind wavering like that, there's some wisdom for you to understand and figure out there. And then once you figure it out, ah, now you can be more stable. The mind can be more steady and you can move on. So this is part of the normal process towards enlightenment. Oftentimes we think that, you know, you should learn teachings and snap the fingers and just be able to do it easily, but that's not the way it is. And, or sometimes people think that when you learn teachings like this from the Buddha or from some other teachers that, you know, 
if these things are happening, that maybe we're a bad person. And, you know, that's not what he's explaining. He's just helping you see the natural laws of existence that, yeah, when there's clinging, there's going to be wavering in the mind. And then when you see that truth for yourself, that your mind's wavering because of the clinging, you're like, man, this guy was so smart. He really understood the mind so well. And then when you see that the clinging is eliminated and there is no wavering in the mind and the mind is very steady and stable, then you're like, wow, he explains it right here 2,500 years ago. So you see the truth, and this is you independently verifying the teaching. So by him explaining it to you like this, and then you observing it in your own mind, that it is clinging that's causing this wavering. And then by eliminating the clinging, it eliminates the wavering. Then you know that, yes, this is indeed the truth. The Buddhist teachings are explaining to you exactly what you're experiencing. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. We'll move on to chapter 19. All right. We'll go to Kayla. Thank you, Manal. Excitement is clinging. One with clinging is not liberated. Here, monks, one seeks excitement and form, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, excitement arises. Excitement and form is clinging. One seeks excitement and feeling, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, excitement arises. Excitement in feeling is clinging. One seeks excitement in perception, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, excitement arises. Excitement in perception is clinging. One seeks excitement in volitional formations or choices and decisions, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, excitement arises. Excitement and volitional formations is clinging. One seeks excitement and consciousness, welcomes it, and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, excitement arises. Excitement and consciousness is clinging. With one's clinging as condition, existence comes to be. With existence as condition, birth. With birth as condition, aging and death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair come to be. Such is the cause of the, this whole mass of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Kayla. So to explain this chapter, I would like to be sure that we talk about the five aggregates because I've talked about this in other classes, but you may not have been in one of those classes. The five aggregates is what makes a being a being. This is the Buddha's description of how we know that there's a living being, which is form, which a living being is going to have this physical form, going to have these feelings or these results of experiences in the mind through the six sense bases. That's how feelings arise, that we take in some contact through the six sense bases, and then there's these feelings that arise in the mind. And then there's these perceptions, which are beliefs or opinions of how things seem to be. And then there's these volitional formations or these choices and decisions that we make. And then there's the consciousness or the mind. So a human being has physical form, we have feelings, we have perceptions, we have volitional formations, and we have consciousness of mind. But a tree, for example, they have physical form, but they don't have feelings, they don't have perceptions, choices, decisions in a mind. So a tree can't decide it's going to uproot itself. It can't make that decision or that choice and then choose to move down the street and replant itself. Or a tree doesn't have a perception, a belief or an opinion. One tree doesn't look at the other tree and says, you know... I think that if your branch grew this way, you would be much more attractive. You don't look quite as attractive with your branch growing that way. You should grow the branch this way, right? A tree doesn't have perceptions. So a tree doesn't have the five aggregates. Other plants don't have five aggregates. But human beings and animals and things like this, we have these five aggregates. So what the Buddha is explaining here is that when we cling to the five aggregates, this is what's going to cause discontentedness. And the key here that he talks about is remains holding to it, right? So one who seeks excitement in form, this is the physical form of the body, welcomes it and remains holding to it. As a consequence of this, excitement arises. 
and excitement in form is clinging. So let me give you an example. Let's say like in my younger years where I wanted the hair to be a certain way, I had this certain physical form and I spent all this time in the mirror and hairspray and mousse and you know, trying to get the hair to be in the perfect spot, you know, just really obsessing over this, remaining holding on to it, right? Like now I got the hair in the perfect spot. And now when I go outside and the hair gets blown around a little bit, now the mind having this excitement earlier that I got it in just the right spot, the mind is clinging to this physical form. And as this excitement arises in the mind, then the mind's discontent. But now when I go outside and there's this wind that blows and messes it up or the rain comes, now there's this painful feelings or this sorrow because the mind was clinging to this physical form of the hair, for example. And we do this with makeup. We do this with jewelry. We do this with clothing. We do this as we age and we see wrinkles or different pimples or moles or different things like this we might have this excitement that arises in our youth because we look very youthful. And then when the mind's clinging and experiences this excitement due to the physical form, it's only a matter of time that that same clinging is going to result in painful feelings as well. And then the same thing is when there's a certain feeling that comes into the mind, you're enjoying that chocolate cake. Wow, I really enjoy this. And now you remain holding on to it, wanting this to be permanent. That's what causes the excitement and then that's also what's going to cause the painful feelings as well of like frustration or anger and the same things with our perceptions if we have certain beliefs or opinions of the way things are in the world and we remain holding on to those then we might take great excitement in those perceptions but now it's only a matter of time before our perceptions are shown to be misperceptions or false beliefs or you know, our opinions are are proven wrong. And then if we're clinging to those perceptions, now there's going to be the sorrow or sadness because of it. Same thing with our choices and decisions. If we make certain choices or decisions, we cling to those. We get all excited about our choices and decisions, going on holiday, going on vacation, going to do a certain thing. We get all this excitement based on our decisions and we cling to that. Now, when things start to change and we're unable to maintain those decisions, now there's going to be these painful feelings. So holding on to these things is what's causing the mind to be discontent. And that excitement is part of the discontentedness. The same thing with consciousness. The consciousness is the mind. That if there are certain things in the mind that the mind is welcoming and holding on to, and it gets excited as these things come into the mind, then the mind's discontent during those pleasant feelings, it's only a matter of time before those painful feelings come in due to the same problem, which is the clinging. So when there's clinging as condition, there's going to be this existence, which is continuous rebirth. And when there's rebirth, there's going to be aging, death, sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair. This whole massive amount of discontentedness. When you see the Buddha talk about such is the cause of this whole mass of discontentedness, He's talking about massive discontentedness because an enlightened mind just has heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of craving, desire, attachment. It's like once, as soon as you clear out two or three or four cravings and you feel a bit of peacefulness, it's only a matter of time before you have to clear out some more and some more and some more. This whole massive amount of discontentedness is because there's this whole massive amount of craving, desire, attachment. But eventually you clear all that out and all of it's gone. All the craving, desire, attachment, all the clinging is gone. And now all the discontentedness is gone as well. And there's no longer rebirth either. So it's these five aggregates that the mind is clinging to. Form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and the consciousness. And the Buddha is teaching us as part of the universal truth of non-self that none of these things are you. This isn't who you are. So you need to maintain it. You need to maintain its health, but don't grab onto these things. Remain holding on to them because that's just going to cause these conditioned feelings, this discontentedness to arise. What questions do you have on this chapter? It doesn't appear there are any questions. All right. We'll move to today's last chapter then. 
chapter 20, which we've had multiple times. Do we need to read this? Maybe we'll just read it just for completeness. You guys may or may not have questions on it. But uh, is there someone who's lined up to read this one? Yes, Marcy. Thank you, Manon. Uh, chapter 20, The Noble Eightfold Path, The Way of Practicing Leading to the Elimination of Discontentedness. And what monks is the noble truth of the way of practicing leading to the elimination of discontentedness? Is it just the noble eightfold path, namely right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration? And what monks is right view? It is monks, the wisdom of discontentedness, the wisdom of the cause of discontentedness, the wisdom of elimination of discontentedness, and the wisdom of the way of practicing leading to the elimination of discontentedness. This is called the right view. And what monks is right intention? The right intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, the intention of harmlessness, this monks is called right intention. And what monks is right speech? Refraining from lying, refraining, refraining from slander, refraining from harsh speech, refraining from frivolous speech, this is called right speech. And what monks is right action? Refraining from taking life, refraining from taking what is not given, refraining from sexual misconduct, this is called right action. And what monks is right livelihood? Here, monks, the noble disciple, having given up wrong livelihood, keeps himself by right livelihood. And what monks is right effort? Here, monks, a monk arouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to prevent the arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome mental states. He arises, he arouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to overcome evil, unwholesome mental states that have arisen. He arouses his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to produce unrisen, unrisen, wholesome mental states. He arises his will, makes an effort, stirs up energy, exerts his mind, and strives to maintain wholesome mental states that have arisen, not to let them fade away, to bring them to greater growth, to full perfection of development. This is called right effort. And what monks is right mindfulness. Here, monks, a monk resides reflecting on body as body, dedicated, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside craving and worry of the world. He resides reflecting on feelings as feelings, dedicated, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside craving and worry of the world. He resides reflecting on mind as mind, dedicated, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside craving and worry of the world. He resides reflecting on mental objects as mental objects, dedicated, clearly aware, and mindful, having put aside craving and worry of the world. This is called right mindfulness. And what monks is right concentration? Here, a monk, distant from self -desi sense, sense desires, distant from unwholesome mental states, enters and resides in the first jhana, which is with thinking and pondering, based in seclusion, filled with excitement and joy, and with the subsiding of thinking and pondering by gaining inner tranquility and oneness of mind, he enters and resides in the second jhana, which is without thinking and pondering, based in concentration, filled with excitement and joy, and with the fading of excitement, remaining imperturbably, I'm sorry, unable to be upset or excited, calm, serene, mindful and clear, clearly aware, and experiences himself the joy of which the noble one says. Peaceful is he who resides with equanimity and mindfulness. He enters the third jhana and had given up pleasure and pain and with the fading away of former gladness and sadness, he enters and resides in the fourth jhana, which is beyond pleasure and pain, purified with equanimity and mindfulness. This is called right concentration. And that, monks, is called the way of practicing leading to the elimination of discontentedness. All right. Thank you, Marcy. So this is the Buddha's core and central teaching, the Eightfold Path. This is what extinguishes discontentedness. This is the path to enlightenment. And a practitioner who actually attains enlightenment 
would know this path inside and out, backwards, forwards, left, right, up and down, like the back of your hand. You would need to know this because you would be practicing this on a regular basis. And I share this as part of our group learning program that I teach on Sundays and Wednesdays in using this book, Volume 1, in order to really make sure you understand this really deeply. And that in this particular book, chapter four and five go into a lot of detail about the Eightfold Path, and then I teach that as part of the group learning program. And this program it shows up in multiple books because it's that core and central teaching that everything's connecting into. Because as you saw here with right concentration, in order to get to the point where you're experiencing the jhanas, those preliminary phases that the mind goes through prior to the first stage of enlightenment, you would need to distance the mind from sense desires or central desire. This is that fourth fetter out of the 10 fetters. By distancing the mind from craving agreeable contact through the senses and being repulsed by disagreeable contact, by distancing the mind from that and no longer seeing things as agreeable and disagreeable, the mind will start experiencing these benefits of the jhanas. And in order to get to enlightenment, of course, you would need to completely eliminate central desire from the mind. But at this point where someone's starting to experience the jhanas, they would have distanced themselves from those central desires, where there's still central desire there, but the mind isn't clinging to these things as tightly as it once was, and it's experiencing less discontentedness because of that. So that's what the Buddha is explaining as part of the Eightfold Path, but a practitioner would really need to know this inside and out, backwards and forwards, and be practicing it on a daily basis to really be experiencing the qualities of mind that ultimately get to enlightenment. So I'd like to just open up to any questions you guys might have now that you guys have been studying in the group learning program and other things, rather than go through and teach each individual step, just thought I would teach the part applicable to the six sense bases and then give you guys a chance to ask any questions you like about any part of the entire Eightfold Path. Looks like Marcy has her hand raised. Thank you, Manal. Thank you, Teacher David. Um, the question I have, teacher, was something that I experienced at work. Um, so there was a rat infestation. Uh, there was poison put out for the rats. Um, and I had come into work early one morning, and a rat was um, passing away in front of me. He was gasping for air and stuff. Immediately, I felt discontentedness because I had a very strong attachment to not seeing animals be harmed. But I was able to reflect upon it and say that this was this rat's decision to eat this rat poisoning for therefore, you know, this is, you know, his steps. So I took the moment and I, upon reflection, I decided that I could use this as a way to show kindness, love and compassion towards this passing being so that its last moments you know, there was someone, you know, kind of with them. And I don't know if this was maybe my still clinging but what I did was I just wrapped um, a blanket around the animal to keep it warm, you know, um, and I set it in a, in, a, in a soft area and just, you know, kind of stood with it until it's like last breath, you know, and then I kind of like ended it at that time of the day and I went on without my day and was, was feeling um, not sad, but not extremely like, you know, this was, I was still, I guess, questioning, pondering. But then later on in the day, my, my coworkers started talking about how they're, you know, murderers, they'll kill all the, you know, rats using vulgar language. And I felt myself really get um, upset and I ended up breaking down and crying. Um, but my question is, is I don't know if what my actions I took or my response to treating the dying animal was the right, you know, within the noble path. And was that my result of crying result because I didn't practice the noble path. Okay, sure. I'll help you with that. So whenever you're talking or thinking about your actions and whether they're part of the Eightfold Path, is always think about harm. You know, did you cause any harm in this situation? Wrapping the animal in a blanket, sitting with the animal, these kind of things, you're not causing any harm in that situation. So because you're not causing harm, harm isn't going to come back to you as a result of the actions that you took there. 
the discontentedness that you experienced upon first seeing the rat and the discontentedness you experienced afterwards is because of the craving desire attachment to animals and to having all animals be completely safe or healthy or you know we'd have to talk about it more to find out exactly what it is but it sounds like it's around that area that the mind has this clinging or craving towards animals wanting them to all be safe and well and while that is a very wholesome intention the mind has to understand in permanence that this isn't actually possible that animals are going to meet harm you're not the one who chose to put out the poison instead your actions were harmless you know you were practicing loving kindness and compassion but it was the craving desire attachment for permanent comfort and animals to be permanently unharmed that caused that discontentedness we'll go to miranda thank you manal uh, this question is slightly unrelated uh, to the chapters that we read today. Um, so if you found a scorpion at your apartment that started to run and hide in every corner, which might ca cause harm to someone living in the apartment and you need to make a quick decision, would you kill the scorpion? I wouldn't. I would attempt to relocate the scorpion outside. And living here in Thailand, I have had that situation, not in the house, but one time a few years ago, we were walking around the village, my, the whole family, and crossing into our path was this big scorpion. We just walked around it, left it in the middle of the street. It wasn't harming us. It wasn't harming anyone else. It was just moseying along the street with this big old stinger out. But you know, there was no need for us to, to harm that being because it wasn't causing any harm. So in a situation where there's a scorpion inside of an apartment, I would try to relocate it outside where it's not going to come in contact with human beings. And that would be how I would handle the situation. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. It doesn't appear there are any other questions. All right. Well, let me just close down all of this and at the same time, thank all of you guys for reading. I appreciate all of you guys who volunteered to read and the moderators. The flow of the class was very smooth and seems like we were really able to explore a lot of personal questions and really get into detail a lot of these chapters. So thank you all for your participation in the class. That really helps to create more depth in the class itself. Next week, of course, we're going to be moving on to the next 10 chapters, which is chapters 21 through 30. So you can read those ahead of time and then come to class and we can have these nice discussions about these individual chapters and specifically how to apply them to your daily life, because that's really helpful to not just understand the chapter and what it, the Buddha is teaching, but the questions you guys are asking about how to apply it to your daily life. That's where I think that you really start to glean the insight and the wisdom of the Buddha of why he taught the things that he taught. So we can do more of that as we continue to go forward in these classes. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we're going to be discussing the four stages of enlightenment and the 10 fetters. The 10 fetters are the 10 individual pollutions of mind. And by eliminating those, the mind moves through the four stages of enlightenment. So I'm going to describe what each one of the individual fetters are and how to eliminate them so that as you move forward, you can eliminate these fetters and move through these four stages of enlightenment. This is still part of the beginning of our group learning program where we're doing this overview because last week in the group learning program, we left off with the jhanas and those four preliminary phases that the mind goes through before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment. Well, now we're going to talk about those four stages and how to move the mind through those four stages. And then next week in the group learning program, we're going to start at chapter one of this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment, volume one. So this Sunday, we're going to be going in depth with the four stages, helping you to understand what those are and what those 10 fetters are, those 10 pollutions of mind. And then on Wednesday, we'll do our fourth class of our four-part series of breathing mindfulness meditation. And then the following week, we're going to actually start our loving kindness meditation. There's a four-part series that we're going to do with that. 
So thank you all again for participating in today's class. I'll see you in perhaps next Saturday's class for the Polycanon and English Study Group and or maybe Sunday and Wednesday as well, depending on what classes you decide to attend. So we'll see you in a future class. Have a very lovely rest of your day. Sawadika. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.